inadvisably or thoughtlessly, but with true love and commitment. So ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to give a special mention to those who cannot be here with us today, those who have passed on to the spirit world. So I'd like to invite Michael to light the candle on the table here before. As the light from the flame glows, we will take a moment now to remember those who are closest to our hearts. And today we hold Stone's brother Paul, Michael's brother Mark, Michael's dad Cal, Michael's mom Sheila, and Don's dad Joe. When you love someone, you do not love them all the time in exactly the same way, from moment to moment. It is an impossibility. It is even a lie to pretend to. And yet, this is exactly what most of us demand. We have so little faith in the ebb and flow of love, of life, and of relationships. We leap at the flow of the tide, and we resist in terror its ebb. We are afraid it will never return. We insist on permanency, on duration, on continuity, when the only continuity possible in life as in love is in growth, in fluidity, and in freedom. In the sense that dancers are free, barely touching as they pass, but they are partners in the same pattern. The only real security is not in owning or possessing, not in demanding or expecting, not in hoping even. Security in a relationship lies neither in looking back to what was and nostalgia, nor forward to what might be in dread or anticipation. But living in the present relationship and accepting it as it is now. Relationships must be like islands. One must accept them for what they are in the here and now, within their limits. Islands surrounded and interrupted by the sea and continually visited and abandoned by the tide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the journey together so far. So many months ago, in 1992, Don and Michael first met. Their paths crossed briefly, but sweetly. Fast forward 15 years later and the universe conspired to bring this beautiful pair together again. It all happened on the Northern Tube Line in London. <laughs> At first the two were friends, and slowly but surely, over time, they became a couple. The seeds of love were, were sown. Throughout their time together, both Dawn and Michael have shared their time being activists for human rights, loving the arts, theatre, and spending plenty of time laughing together. <coughs> when I spoke with them recently, they described a beautiful picture of sitting on the balcony together, watching the stars and gazing up into the planets, and pondering all the possibilities they hold. When I asked Dawn what she loves in Michael, she told me, He's different. He always sees the good in others, and he is a believer in people. The only thing that drives her crazy is his stubbornness and his inability to clean the kitchen. <laughs> Michael loves that Dawn is so vibrant, she's bright, she's quirky, and she is a joy to be around. It was in 2020 on Valentine's Day. Central London, a French restaurant. They enjoyed a romantic meal together. Afterwards, as they sat digesting, Michael passed his mother's wedding ring to Dawn and said those four immortal words, Will you marry me? To which Dawn replied, her very important yes. Michael thought to himself, this is perfect, and she is perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, that wonderful moment in the lives of this couple has brought us to this wonderful moment today, 
Can I have a round of applause for our individual lights now shining before us tell us that both of you are bright lights on this earth, living with honour, taking responsibility, and offering care and love to those who are important in your life. The light also symbolises the life given to you by your parents. So I will now ask John and Michael to light the centre unity candles together. <laughs> As the flame from the center candle rises upward, may the light of your combined lives shine into the heavens in a beam that is now stronger and brighter because it unites the two flames of your hearts. May the flame of your love shed its light on your married life in all of the years to come. Have a seat. talking and listening, supporting and believing in each other. 
So now, now I'm going to ask you both to stand. Your sister chair is back for you.
vocalist. Mm. That's hard. I'm Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm very honored to be the best man here. Dolph, yes. actually. Dawn was a witness at my wedding to Joyce, and I haven't forgiven her since. <laughs> and Michael stood and guarded the door. So we got enough Lennon sisters out here to keep Michael in the <laughs> Not a problem. But, I mean, the, I heard the lady today, the solemnizer, give the you know, explanation of how Dawn and Michael met. That's not the truth. <laughs> Dawn was at Loretta's school convent. <laughs> Michael was standing in front in a trench coat with a bag of candy. <laughs> That's a new one. <laughs> Some years later, after he got out of prison, um, Michael had met Dawn again at ICAP, which is where Dawn had a job and Michael worked there. Dawn was, was famous. Michael was the only guy who did not try to get into Dawn's fingers. Or so he tells me. Mm, I believe it. Um, eventually, they later met on a train. That is true. Nor did I. It was an underground train. It's a very good thing they met when they did, because today with all the train strikes, they never would have met. So, but, yeah, moving on. Um, so, the first time I ever met Michael Yankowski, who is my best friend, and I'm glad, you know, to be here, to be saying what I'm saying. But the first time I met him, I get this call, and I'm like, my daughter, Brennan, has this new friend at school, Isabel. I'm like, okay, that's great. So, Isabel's coming over for dinner. It's like, okay, that's great. And so, I get home from work, and this dude shows up. And his daughter shows up, and you know, his daughter and my daughter are playing, and we're sitting out in the front garden, or the back garden. Next thing I know, he puts his drink down and starts doing cartwheels. <laughs> like, the dude is 15 years old. He's freaking doing cartwheels in my back garden. And I'm like, I thought you were a banker. <laughs> uh, apparently, no. Michael Yankowski was also a gymnast. <laughs> no, no, all of what I'm going to tell you might be true. Um, I was a gymnast. And then later I'm like, okay, so you're a my grand gymnast. Well, I was also a ballerina. I mean, a ballet dancer. Um, so he was a ballet dancer. Okay, so I find out he's a ballet dancer. And then I'm like, well, okay, gymnast, ballet dancer, banker. I was also an actor. I'm like, what do you mean you were an actor? Oh yeah, I was in two episodes of Y5O. Like, Seriously? Yup, he was in two episodes. He's got a famous line. He's very famous. His famous line, I'll get you, my Garrett. <laughs> so, okay, I think I'm done with all that. Alright, so we got ballerina, we got gymnast, we got actor. Well, then I find out he owns these businesses. I'm like, okay, so what kind of business is he Well, okay, he owned a girl band, right? He owned four women, okay? I thought that was illegal. Um, in fact, if he was in California, he'd be paying reparations very shortly. But no, 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 and now he's owned by one. <laughs> He was in, he worked for the government. <laughs> for those of you who have a rest warrants, government is spelled C-I-A, you might want to leave. Um, so, yeah, okay, there was that. <laughs> then he, he, he I, I just learned something about him today. He was a farmer. <laughs> a potato farmer. <laughs> was destined to become Irish, so it was very, 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 very clear. But, so I can continue on all the businesses and jobs he's had and everything, and they might all be true, or he might have just been blowing smoke up my ass for the last 18 years. I don't know which it was. So, yeah. But, to finish off my speech, I must say this. Michael Jankowski, my best friend, I am so happy he's married and gone. This is a fucking great wedding. So.
used to it, though. No, I'm not used to it, though. I can't follow that. I just, I can't. Because I had to make notes and stuff. I'm trying to black pill more. <laughs> Saying the shit all the way. <laughs> 70 quid a night. You <laughs> Jim Rat <Rathbury> for here. <laughs> the other one, obviously. Anyway, I'm supposed to talk with Donna's sister. So I made a few notes about Donna's big sister. And anyone who has a slightly older sibling will get this, I think. Slightly. <laughs> slightly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Loads. <laughs> I've had no work done. <laughs> so, bro, that one is a sister. Kind, caring, very overprotective. <laughs> Of her baby brother. <laughs> so now me and Don talked about as months have gone on and leading up to this. But what I should talk about. So I, I chose two incidents as kids. But bear in mind this was back in the eighties. <laughs> so I chose two. One was when um, we were, I don't know, I think the at I called it the attic incident. <laughs> You can't remember me, yeah, it's your lying pasta chip. <laughs> anyway, we, I was, uh, I don't know, 10. Wayne was 3. And Wayne was an ED kid, do you remember? <laughs> Absolutely, brother. <laughs> anyway, Mum and Dad were going to the gate bar, that was the gate. Gate bar. Gate bar. <laughs> and Don, do you remember when trying to get him to bed? Oh, oh no, he's one of these well, kids. We wanted to be going to gate bar too. No, well, yeah. Oh, well. Getting him to bed, he's one of these kids that, when he, he was three. He still can't go to bed. And to get him to bed, you had to like, you were the babysitters. And you had to like, um, get to sleep if you could. It could take hours for But then the slightest move to get out of the bed for him. It's the off the bed, right? The slightest creak. Yeah! <laughs> 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 so I said to my mum, oh, don't send to me, that's your incident. <laughs> <laughs> and we were babysitting. And we lived next door in Keeper Road in Trimden. Now bear in mind, this is rough, rough place to live. Like, Keeper Road in Trimden, in the city club, and the whole like, rough, like, rough, rough. <laughs> so we lived next door to a family called the Canes. Now the Canes were. <laughs> I don't know how to describe them with that. I don't want to be insulted like you. No, I won't. I won't. I'm not going to be insulted. They were like going back in strange. It was like um, a family of siblings, but nobody knew, knew who the dad was. We thought it was one of the brothers. We went to shore like. <laughs> <laughs> I this particular night, I said to, uh, Don said to me, let's go and get in the attic. I said, for what? For, well, we can crawl through in the attic. We can crawl through the little hole between the rooms. Now, she's taller than me. <laughs> I'm only ten. So I got hit to bed. Managed to get out of the bedroom. Like, that was great. Split bedroom. Remember we had the big bedroom and it was split in half for a partition. And the boys on one side, the girls on the other. I don't know where I was from, from one side to the other, like, you know, playing the dolls. <laughs> uh, I'd rather be shagging Ken, but I hadn't got two Kens. Anyway, <laughs> 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 oh, get some to bed. Mum and Dad's in the gate bar, as usual, like. And, uh, <laughs> 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 
so Don gets the chair from my bathroom. <laughs> so, because I was only small, I had to hold the chair while she got in the attic. So she did, she got in the attic, she put herself up right in the attic. So I stood on the chair, she went, come on. They're caring, overprotective. Right? So, she pulls me up into the attic, and then at this stage it's about half ten, something like that. Mum dad's still out, so I grabbed our little scheme to get through the hole in the attic. And we were only going there to see what we could rob. <laughs> so anyway, I'm a little ten year old, and she went, Come on, I'll pull you up. <laughs> so she did. <laughs> so I managed to go onto the, the opening of the the what do you call it? The opening yeah, of the, the hatch. The hatch. The hatch. <laughs> Never said that the hatch. Yeah. So I'm sitting on the hatch. It turns on the beams because we hadn't got fancy like floorboards or not. It not really fancy. So Dawn's on the beams like this. <laughs> and she's trying to crawl over it to the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then two minutes later, I heard the door go. <laughs> and his mum and dad, and I went caring, overprotective. I says, oh Jesus, I'm his mum, I don't know why I said it was ten. It's my mum and dad's home. She fell through my mum and dad's roof. <laughs> I did live to repair that at some point. <laughs> When newspaper <laughs> so we wouldn't get into too much trouble. She was over on holidays, so that's why I don't have the Oh, so I'm sitting on the thing, dangling my little ten-year-old legs. I went, Don, look. This is Don's covered in all sorts, right? And the plaster and all of it. So she ran downstairs and went, Ma, Dad, you won't believe what John's done. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you know. oh, yeah. <laughs> and then there's a one more story I just wanted to tell. I was 15 years old. It was 1984, actually. Is that your wedding job? Oh, no. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. And Katrina and the waves were playing in St. Stephen's Spring. And it was a, a young people's, they was walking on sunshine and all that stuff. And, remember, and they did this concert, an open concert to the screen. Remember that dog? Yeah. And they said it was for young people, no alcohol involved. Yeah. They said. Yeah. But I didn't realise that Dawn was using me so she'd go out and club with our mates. So I was babysitting him. <laughs> Again, <laughs> he was seven. <laughs> now he could go to bed by himself at this point, like, you know, that, we sorted all that. <laughs> so I decided, because they said, Katrina and the way they said, now you have to dress up as your favourite pop star. <laughs> no, she spent the night getting ready as uh, Madonna. Remember? And I decided that I was going to dress up as my George, because he was like, <laughs> Now having three sisters, older sisters living at home and all that, there was loads of makeup, there was loads of bits that you could do yourself up. <laughs> so I thought genuinely, I said, Mom, Dad, I want to go to this concert. She was the one who wanted to go out. So my dad says to John, he went, well Don, you can go out if you can meet John and look after John. Oh fine, no problem, that's me green light to go out to the concert. So I spent the evening, him sleeping, waiting for home and dad to come home. They come home early, which is great. I don't know, 10 o'clock, whatever. And my dad's face, when he saw me in full boy church, then full makeup, I looked like a, I don't know what, Aunt Sally on speed. <laughs> <laughs> but bear in mind, we're in Drilna. 
So you have to get this needle really and you have to walk through Drimna. <laughs> and fifth of being a prick and gay is the wrong city in the world. And I've got all that corks and everything from here and the tires and wool. <laughs> so I walked through on my own. <laughs> on my own because Brian couldn't go because his dad wouldn't let <laughs> so what was uh, Oh, Drimden, Dolphins Bar, the Flats, Fatna Mansions, <laughs> go across George Street into Stephen's Green, on my own! <laughs> so I'm all excited to get there and think, oh, this is going to be great. No, Dawn, I had to walk all the way back by myself. <laughs> The overprotective, loving, caring. Yeah. Now I'm going to end this now because my nurse has gone even doing this like, you know what I mean? But she is overprotective and caring and loving and wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Michael, come yeah. peace. More proud to have you as my, finally, my official brother in law. Well, listen, I need to end this now. I was going to say something about, uh, do you know when you've got a sibling who's slightly older and when they're following you and your mates and eventually you go, oh, come on now, man, you hit this up. And you look for stones and you're straight up. <laughs> and they got home. And they just got home. And they won't. But Dawn was so caring. She didn't throw big stones. <laughs> average ones. Just average like. Kind person. <laughs> and the one last thing I want to say, and by the way, everyone looks magnificent. Magnificent. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Everyone. Everyone. Just one last thing to say. I don't want to bring things down, but I need to mention Paul and little Josh. Um, everyone think positive energy, they're making recovery. Big, big, big. Yes, sir. So let's continue to give the positive energy, the love, the love like the solemnizer, wherever she was called. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there, Mike. I'm not going there, Mike. <laughs> it's too easy. But big positive energy to Paul and little Josh. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. That was a fantastic speech. I don't think it was the attic you came out of. I think it was the closet. But um, be that as it may. Um, I did. I was told one thing I need to warn everyone here about. Don said that half of Dolphin's barn is in here. Just so you know, the other half of Dolphin's barn is robbing your houses right now. <laughs> So no, um, last but not least, we have a speech from the gentleman who Don was drunk enough to marry, um, Mr. Michael Yankowski. Yeah. I say it's, it's goodness to be here, just to see all of you and to feel the energy that's here. My community is very touching. It's very touching for me because there's so much energy and so much positive love here, and it's, it's really amazing. There's so, there's so many of you that I've met, I know, I see you, but you know, it, it, you don't spend enough time, and it's, it's, it's really great. And so I feel honored to be able to stand up in front of here to all of you and just say, you know, 